We watched Impact, everyone. We watched Impact. Bobby Roode, Kazarian, and Daniels came out together. Chris Daniels, for like half of the segment, I thought he was actually wearing a garbage sack around his neck, like a hefty bag. And then he zoomed in on him. It was a scarf. It was a scarf made of a shiny fabric. It was like made of rubber. Yeah. A patent so, leather scarf, I think it actually was, for real. It may have been. So, uh, Kaz referred to the fans as chodes. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> that, this is a gimmick, apparently. He's going to find a, a, a new a new uh, insult used by 14-year-olds to, to describe the fans each week. So, they all jibber-jabber for a while. They called out AJ. AJ and Daniel talked about their match. They got in a fight, and Storm and Hardy made the save, and that was it. Devon versus Samoa Joe. First of all, I don't know what they did to the TV belt. But it was so sparkly, it looked like they had attached tiny electronic lights to it. Well, it's Christmas. Apparently, they, they may have. They may have christmas out the belt. Speaking of belts, Joe had a silver waistband on his trunks that made his ribs look like they had been duct taped. <laughs> and uh, Devon was wearing at least three layers of clothing. <laughs> I yeah. was I was baffled. <laughs> Perhaps he had a match in a blizzard after the show. Taz noted that he had a vest on and... Joe knows submissions. Perhaps Joe would use the vest like a gi and choke him out. That would have been an awesome finish. So they wrestled for a bit. A hot blonde came out and distracted the ref. And uh, Doc showed up and he hit Joe with a gimmick. And he even got the win and he won the title. And the uh, gang members all celebrated and they had the hot babes. And uh, just as a few moments ago, Brian, you gave me credit for my beat it joke. You had your best joke ever here when you referred to these women and just said, those are the eights. <laughs> That was awesome. Al Snow and D'Lo were talking backstage. Al Snow said he had no memory of what happened last week. It, doctors had done tests on him. He has nothing wrong with his blood work or anything. He just woke up in a hospital with no wallet or phone or memory of how he had got there. D'Lo, a detective, determined that he had been mickeyed. Is that what he said? Mickeyed. <laughs> Perhaps you can find the Maltese Falcon next. I've never heard that that term. Ironically, the next person to come out was Mickey. Mickey James. I wonder if one plays into the other. It might. Perhaps she she Mickeyed him. <laughs> Google. I'm not spreading rumors. You've been Mickeyed. Nothing comes up. So she says she said she was back. She said she would make uh she, excuse me. She said she would win the women's title at the pay per view. Tara and Jesse came out. They jibber jabbered for a while. Mickey made fun of Jesse's shoes. The only time I saw Jesse's shoes, they were like white sneakers. Meanwhile, meanwhile Mickey is walking around in these ridiculous heels with lifts in the the ball of the foot, and she was still like four inches shorter than Tara. Velvet Sky came out, did the whole entrance, let the pigeons loose, all that. Had a ridiculous amount of makeup on, like ridiculous by TNA women's standards. She thanked Brooke Hogan for bringing her back to TNA. She vowed that 213 would be the year of Velvet Sky. And I thought this was like the worst Chinese New Year of all time. But then she finished the sentence, the year of Velvet Sky as Knockouts Champion. What a wacky coincidence. I was looking up, uh, gotten mickeyed. And I'm on the Urban Dictionary. And, uh, there are a number of, uh, entries with Mickey in the title. Including, uh, Mickey Rourke. Mick Foley, and Mickey James. Let's see what it says about Mickey James. An Urban Dictionary? Let's see here. Mickey James, the rarest of the rare, a WWE diva that is both hot and can wrestle, has a super nice, thick, ghetto ass. Using a sentence, did you see that girl's ass? Almost as nice as Mickey James. Oh, God. This person here writes, The current WWE Women's Champion as of July 12, 2008, she began her career in 1999 and wrestled in independent circuits in TNA as Alexis Lurie. 2004, she got a developmental contract with the WWE, wrestled in Ohio Valley until 2005 where she debuted under real name as the obsessed fan stalker of Trish Stratus. After Trish's retirement, Mickey went on to drop the psycho gimmick and win the Women's Championship three more times. She has amazing, substantial in-ring ability and as stated by the previous editor, she has a beautiful ass. I had to read the whole thing just to get to that punchline. <laughs> I had to go a long way to get to that one. All right. Should I continue? Sure. 
We had a great segment with Rob Terry teaching Robbie E. how to use a tablet to buy car insurance. It was blatant product placement. It was goofy humor about Robbie E. being so dumb he couldn't figure out how a touch, touch screen worked. He was trying to shake it like an etch a sketch. It made me laugh. They had a promo for a show in January. All they had was the date and a bunch of wacky graphics and scary words such as their road to hell will be, will be paved in blood. That's no good. That's how you pave a road in blood. I guess blood will eventually dry out. Robbie E. and Robbie T. wrestled Chavo and Hernandez. Hernandez got a bunch of new ink, including what appears to be in the center of his chest, like his flesh is tearing away to reveal a Superman logo. Got a hot tag, made a sloppy comeback, guys were falling all over the place, getting in each other's way, and not a moment too soon, Chavo tagged himself back in, or got tagged back in, and he pinned Robbie E. with a frog splash. And Joey Ryan distracted them from the ramp, Matt Morgan jumped them from behind and laid them out. Ryan talked for a bit, and apparently their team name is Big Morgan and the Big Organ. Big Morgan and the Big Organ. Yeah. I got nothing else to add. TNA, everybody. (laughs) They changed the name from Impact Wrestling to TNA, and now there's a group called Big Morgan and the Big Organ. Why'd you bother changing the name? The Aces partied with the Eights in their treehouse. Lots of jokes about drinking and boobs and stuff. And uh, they were going to throw a dart at the, at the board and pick a new target when the uh, boss interrupted and said they had been paid off to make a hit tonight. And he started counting money and they were all happy. Kurt Angle and Garrett Bischoff and Wes Briscoe celebrated Briscoe's contract win last week. Chavo, Guerrero, and Hernandez cut a horrible promo. Hyping up the tag match at the pay-per-view. Chavo Guerrero's a poor badass. He does not intimidate me. We're going to stomp on your face, he said. <laughs> We're going to stomp on your face. Yeah, I didn't buy this one bit. Yeah. It sounded like a guy playing pro wrestler. Yeah. It sounded like it sounded like a, a dad playing pro wrestler with his eight-year-old son. It sounded like a dad playing Eddie Guerrero. No, it's not, nothing like Eddie. No, that's the point. I see. A dad playing Eddie Guerrero. Hmm. Like if you played Eddie Guerrero. Hmm. Actually, yeah. Kurt Angle wrestled Doc. At one point, Doc chokes land him onto his head. It's Kurt Angle. Be gentle with him. He's fragile. It was a fun match. Had a shitty finish. Angle got the ankle lock on. The Aces and Eights attacked him for the DQ. He was able to fight them off briefly, but they were about to swarm him again when Joe, Garrett, and Wes Briscoe ran down to even the odds. And Angle challenged them to an eight-man tag in the pay-per-view, and that was it. I wonder if they're going to pull the trigger on the Horseman beatdown already. Would that require all three of them to turn on, Kurt? I guess they just take out... Well, it'd be uh, it'd be six on two. Oh, so Garrett and Wes Briscoe. Too. Yes. Okay, that would work, that would work. Yeah. Hogan was on the phone backstage with Joe Park, telling him to go train with Al Snow in OVW before Hogan would book yeah, him again. Yeah, kept going, call Al Snow, and Al Snow had just been on the show. Yeah. He's like, call, call, call Al Snow in Ohio Valley. And I was like, Al Snow is in Tampa right now, or Orlando. Just put him on the phone, Hulk. So Bully Ray came in, demanded a match with Austin Aries. Hogan was burying him for being small time. So the universe did not revolve around him and said no. So Ray said he was taking over the show and he would get his match before the end of the night. I have no idea if I'm supposed to cheer for either of these men. I'm not inclined to. Hogan was acting like a real dick. As was Bully. Oh, we'll get into this by the later. James Storm was talking to Jeff Hardy backstage. He said he would have Hardy's back, but he warned him not to fall for any of Bobby Roode's traps. His tricks. So he walked away, and then we got Jeff Hardy's internal dialogue in slow motion. That's right. Not only can you hear Jeff Hardy's thoughts now, but you can hear his thoughts as he moves in slow motion. Yeah. No bites! I mean, it, 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 it would be stupid no matter what. But it's not like he's thinking anything interesting anyway. He thinks things like he doesn't trust James Storm. He might be an outlaw. It's nothing that takes me out of this program more than when I can read Jeff Hardy's mind. 
Because I know that ain't what he's thinking. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Three-way, Kid Cash versus Zima Ion versus Kenny King. Winner get the uh, title shot at Rob Van Dam at the pay-per-view. No entrances, no entrances for anyone, so they're all geeks. Uh, it's actually a fun match. Uh, sloppy sometimes, but it was three X-Division dudes hitting a bunch of giant moves and dives. Crowd loved it. And finish was actually awesome because Ion, uh, Ion dumped Cash to one side. Then he turned around into a springboard blockbuster from King. Only their timing was a little off, and King started his move before Ion turned around, and he actually had to balance on the rope for a moment before gi- diving across the ring with a blockbuster. That was awesome. Then he picked him up and hit a fireman's carry into a urinagi for the win. So, Kenny King... Kenny King won! Who has... This is his first impact match in months and months, is getting a title shot. Yeah, Kenny King disappeared. Yeah. And then he came back yeah. for last week's show, was eliminated immediately. Yeah. And now he's the number one contender. Yeah. All right. Bully Ray was on the phone telling whoever he was talking to that he was pissed off a of Hulk. He vowed to take over the show and get what he wanted. So, after commercial, he came to the ring to get what he wanted. He said he wanted to fight Ares. Ares wanted to fight him. All the people wanted to see them fight. And he was going to sit in this chair until Hogan made the match. Ares comes out, pointed out the last time they had fought, he had tapped Ray out. He said Ray didn't want to fight. He was only pretending so he could impress Brooke. Ray dared him to fight right now. Aries said, no, I'm going to sit in this chair on the ramp, but I'm going to take over the show. And then Hogan came out, and Aries said, I'm going to sit over here. So Ray and Hulk got in the ring. They had a stare down. Hulk said he was not making the match because he was in charge and nobody was pushing him around. He threatened to fire bully or kick his ass. They had a stare down. Fans chanted, fight, fight, fight. Aries got the fans to chant, fight, fight, fight. Crowd wanted to see them fight. Brooke came out to make peace. She called Bully Mark. Hogan noticed this. He got upset. So upset that he booked Bully Ray versus Austin Aries. Yeah. This program sucks. And by the way, we had Bully presumably on the phone with Brooke. Yeah. And then Bully in the ring with Brooke. And both times he yelled at her. Hell of a relationship so far. Nothing about this makes any sense. I guess I understand why a Hulk Hogan, a man who's been around wrestlers his entire life, will be upset one was dating his daughter. That part I can get. Why is Ray so angry with Hulk? Why does Austin Because he wants a match with Austin Aries and Hulk won't give it to him. Okay, that part. Even before this started. Last week, he came out after the... Two weeks ago, they did the big reveal that... Brooke and Bully Ray are a couple. and then Maybe. We don't really actually know that. Well, Ray came out the next week. He was angry at Hulk about something. He said, you don't want to know that I'm your, the number one man in your daughter's life. No, he said, do you want to know who is? I see. He actually didn't answer. Ah. It could be a swerve. Ah. Yeah. Starland sucks. It's better than Cena and AJ. Still Perhaps sucks. he's a heel and the number one man in Brooke's life is Garrett Bischoff. That would piss me off. <laughs> if it, I... Hulk is going to say, no, no, I changed my mind. Go with Bully. And we have the main event. Bobby Roode, Frankie Kazarian, Chris Daniels versus Jeff Hardy, James Storm, and AJ Styles. This was great! First of all, first thing first. If any of you remain unconvinced as to the greatness of Chris Daniels or Frankie Kazarian, you just need to watch this entrance. (laughs) They came out in Zuba's pants, black high tops, Fanny packs and muscle shirts. Yep. Better yet, they wrestled in the Zuba's pants. Yep. It's just the best team there could ever be. That's all there is to it. This was how I wrestled in the uh, Youth Wrestling Federation in 1993. <laughs> yeah. That exact same outfit. Yes, and, and you were small. Yep. Yeah. So great. God, those were the days. <laughs> oh, God. So, uh,. Yes, they had a match. It was, in fact, great. Uh, Shawn Michaels is retired, which pretty much makes Jeff Hardy the world's best babyface in peril. So they beat him up for a long time. He made a hot tag to AJ, who ran wild briefly, but then got cut off, and James Storm had to come in to save him. And later, he made a comeback again. He got to hit a double DDT thing, and then he tried to springboard, but he got cut off, and Storm had to save him again. And they started to bicker, and while they were bickering, Hardy tagged himself in and binned Kazarian with a twist of fate. Yep. 
Great story. Great match. This was this was excellent pro wrestling. I cannot deny that. This was such a good match that no matter how bad anything was previously on the show, when the show was over, I was satisfied. Yeah. And I thought, great impact. It's how good that main event was yeah. to me. So, uh, yes, Storm and AJ left together, still bickering. Hardy watched them go and shrugged it off and started to celebrate. Aces and Aids came out to kill him. He killed him briefly until Storm returned with a chair to chase them off. And they stopped, and they all looked up at the top of the ramp, and there at the top of the ramp was Bobby Roode smiling and clapping. So he was the one who hired the Aces and Aids to kill Jeff Hardy. Because he's rich. It pays to be rude, he says. Mm -hmm. And he gave them a thumbs up, and the camera cut to the Aces and Apes, and the camera's like low, like the, like the cameraman was kneeling in front of them. So you see Devon in the foreground and the other short guy in the foreground with all the giants behind him. And like at the same time, they all give a giant thumbs up. Yeah. And this needs to be the next internet fad. This needs to be, the, needs to be pictures of Devon and the Aces and Aces giving a thumbs up down at the bottom to say like, the Aces and Aces like this thread <laughs> or whatever. That needs to be the next thing going around. Aces and Aces endorse this thread. Yes. The Aces and Aces give this thread a thumbs up. I liked the last uh, 20 minutes of this show. I thought it was excellent. Show itself. Hey, if the main event is good enough that I forget everything else on the rest of the show and I'm satisfied, then I'm satisfied. So I give this impact a thumbs up. Yeah. Of course, when the show's over, you realize that was the go-home show for the pay-per-view. Why do they do pay-per-views? I don't well, even... well, is they, it a do, long story? they do pay-per-views because they have contracts with pay-per-view companies. And uh, next year, they are eliminating two pay-per-views. They're getting rid of the uh, the February and the September pay-per-views. So we'll at least be down to 10. It would be better the year after if they could drop it to six and just do a pay-per-view every other month. But uh, especially since they kind of have a, they have a mindset now where, like, it seems they have an important pay-per-view and then they have a non-important pay-per-view. Yes. And then an important pay-per-view and a non-important pay-per-view. And to me, it's like, why don't you just axe the non-important pay-per-view? Or do a best of. Make a really big impact that week, and then get back to building for your big pay-per-view. You would think. This show on Sunday, I feel this show doing no buys. No buys. Even with uh, even with Jeff Hardy in the main event, no buys. I think it's going to do the uh, 6,000, 65, maybe 7,000, but it ain't doing 11 this month. And uh, and there probably will be stuff happening on the show, but just from watching the go-home show, I mean, who could possibly have any interest in the show on Sunday? I was driving up tonight, and uh, I knew I, was, I knew there was a pay-per-view on Sunday. I knew Hardy and Rude was the main event. I was trying to think of any other match on the show. I thought they, they were doing... They had four announced this afternoon. I thought they were doing Storm and AJ. And they got here and remembered, oh yeah, it's AJ and Daniels. Yeah, the last ever match. Yeah. That should be good. Well, it would be a good match, yeah. but they've done a very poor job of building the show. That's as far as interest, yep. Just not there. But... And it's like, it's not even... They are not interested in promoting their own pay-per-view. That's part of it, yeah. The the biggest things in TNA right now are Aces and Eights and who's Brooke fucking, and neither of these are relevant to the pay-per-view show. At least not significant. I'm not sure how many matches are actually on the show. Let me find out, because this plays into my... Uh... Yeah, no one cares. Well, it's very important because this afternoon they had four matches, and uh, I want to see how many matches they have right now. Actually, it'll be five because they added the eight man, unless that was magically pre-booked before the angle. Oh, they they added more than that. I'm just wondering if they added fifty, per, if they added a hundred percent of matches or whatever. If they doubled it, doubled it. They added the X title match. They have seven now, so we went from four to seven. So they added three full matches. They added Rob Van Dam. RVD and Kenny King, yeah. Bully Ray and Austin Aries, Kurt Angle, Joe, and Wes Briscoe against Garrett Bischoff and Aces and Eights. Did you say Kurt Angle and Joe? Oh, I'm sorry. They, 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 yeah. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Carry on. Wait a second. Eight-man tag. Oh, that was, that Kurt was Angle, Joe, Wes Briscoe, and Garrett yes. Bischoff. You said Aces Kurt Angle and Joe. I thought they were wrestling each other. I That's see. where I got confused. There you go. So, yeah, seven matches, everybody, and uh, who knows? Maybe another one added as well. And Jeff Hardy and Bobby Roode is, in fact, the main event for the title. I predict 7,000 buys. Predict seven buys. All right, so TNA, final resolution, a pay-per-view. First thing that happens is James Storm comes out dressed to wrestle. The announcers point out that 
on the last pay-per-view one month ago, he had won a title shot. Then he lost the title shot on Impact. And here he is a month later, he's not even booked on the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. What a plummet. Yep. What a, a, a descent. <laughs> Embarrassing. So he mentions he is not booked. He uh, calls out uh, Bobby Roode, perhaps thinking that Bobby Roode would want to come brawl with him a few hours before his world championship match. Instead, Kazarian comes out. He made jokes about Storm being an alcoholic. Called him a goat roper. Keep in mind, this is all on pay-per-view. Yeah. Called him a goat roper. Storm made fun of him because he had all day to think of a promo, and that was the best he could, he could come up with. So Storm knew, apparently, that Cass would be coming out to interrupt him. I was going to say, now how did how did uh, that makes no sense. It doesn't, but it did almost make Cass laugh, so it was worth it. Plus, no one watched the show anywhere. So eventually they had a match. took a long time to get started, and uh, they had a house show match. And that... I will, that real quick is just, that is the theme of the show. I don't know if I've ever seen so many fine matches on a pay per view before. I've seen m- hundreds of pay per views better than this. I've seen hundreds worse than this. But if you like two to two and a half star matches, this is a show for you. They did some stuff. There was a rest hold. Stormy just come back. They teased their trademark spots. And finally, Storm won with a super kick. Storm is injured, which is why he's fat and wasn't working very hard. Had a shirt on, yeah. Which begs the question, why'd you put him in the ring? That is a great question. So, you know, it's two guys who know what they're doing, so it didn't suck or anything, but it's absolutely nothing you need to see. Kenny King wrestled Rob Van Dam. It was a bit of a mind trip to seeing these two men in the ring together. It's the... Aging ECW guy against the uh, ROH guy here in TNA. So, and they basically had a Rob Van Dam match. Did the spot where they exchanged a bunch of holds. They both missed kicks and they trade off or face off. Rob, uh, for once in his life, Rob Van Dam, they did not get a heat on him by shoving him off the top rope into the guardrail. He was kicked off the top rope into the guardrail. Learning new tricks here in 2012. Did more stuff. Rob is getting clumsier as he ages, and he also looked blown up by the end. And uh, he missed his frog splash. Kenny tried his fireman's carry slam, but Rob escaped, and he did that body scissors roll up that only he and Kung Lee do, and he won. I thought this match pretty much sucked. That's just me. I'm going to say it sucked. I went exactly two stars. And frankly, it's not worth arguing about. So if you say it was worse, great. Have at it. I think if you watched carefully, you would realize... I will say this. These two men suck together. It was, it was not the worst match in the show, I will say that. And I will also say that uh, had I watched the uh, Falls Can Anywhere DVD first, I probably would have rated this the entire show much lower. Borash interviewed Chris Daniels backstage. He listed like every possible stipulation match you can think of, and then noted that he and AJ had done all of them. But tonight, he was going to prove he was the better man. This was good. Joey Ryan and Matt Morgan versus Chavo Guerrero and Hernandez. <laughs> this was also overrated, I can tell. No. This, he gave this two and a half stars. This? Oh, fuck no. This is just awful. First of all, Joey Ryan. I've had enough. <laughs> this is a guy, this is a fan who thinks that what wrestling is, is doing poses and catchphrases. And in between, you must do a few moves once in a while to kill time. Then uh, Morgan came in. <laughs> they did a spot. They had the heat on Chavo, obviously. And uh, they did a spot where Morgan came in without a tag. You know, I'm sorry. I'm, re- I'm misreading my own notes. Perhaps I'm the one who sucks. Hernandez gets the hot tag and runs wild. Morgan comes in without a tag and cuts him off. And he suplexes him right on to Joey Ryan, who is his partner. And I thought, well, either Ryan failed to move out of the way or Hernandez, or Morgan's a dumb shit who didn't look where he was going. Then Morgan picks up Ryan's limb body and suplexes it onto Hernandez. So I guess that was a spot they planned to do. Five seconds later, Hernandez was on offense again. Five seconds after that, Morgan was back in to cut him off again. They tried to clothesline Morgan out of the ring. 
only Morgan can't take the backwards bump out of the ring, so he had to turn his back and just stand there like an idiot waiting for Hernandez to hit him so he could go over the ring, over the ropes forward. This is a bump that Kane will often do when he's leaving the ring for fun. I don't think Kane is ever going to be confused with someone like, you know, Shawn Michaels or... or and Golden he's 45. Or, and he's 45 years old. Hernandez or, or Morgan is very tall. This should be very easy. He has not learned how to do it after like a decade in this business. So then Chavo hit a frog splash. Then Morgan pulled the ref out of the ring. And Chavo tried a Pescado. And Morgan hit a, or Hernandez hit a Superman dive. I guess they're going to still feud. I hated this match. This sucked. You didn't mention how orange Mad Morgan was. Mad Morgan's very orange. Mad Morgan is, he looks like an orange. That's how orange he is. I'm not talking like he's got a deep tan. I'm talking he he, uh, he bought something at the Halloween store if you're going to make yourself an orange. Or a pumpkin. For Halloween. <laughs> or a pumpkin. And, again... The exact same Matt Morgan I've seen for 10 years. Yeah. He has not improved one bit in 10 years. No. He has devolved. Yes. Which, I guess the carbon footprint is apropos. Perhaps. And by the way, they had a line here where they said Morgan had had a... They used the term a combine with the Rams. And they said he had in this combine he had bench pressed 655 pounds. Incorrect. And before I get too far into this, I will note the announcers were laughing at this like this was clearly bullshit. But still, every part of this is bullshit. This is where you, you when you read the Observer and uh, they'll put up, you know, the, the, the raw will have the did you know fact, which 99% of all humans just fast forward through and don't even bother reading. But Dave Meltzer will, will read and edit and write 200 words about what bullshit it is. That's how I felt about this fact. Annoying. Well, what's your 200 words? You want? Okay. So. You can't tease us like this. I didn't think, honestly, I didn't think anyone would care. But it's in, the, it's in the newsletter, everyone. So, NFL teams do not do combines. Occasionally, they will work a guy out. They're not going to put him on the bench press and see how much he can do on a one rep bench. What they do is, when they want to know uh, your, your strength and your, your, your muscular endurance as much as anything, they put 225 pounds on the bar. That's 245s on each side and the bar itself. Even I knew this, and you have to do it as many times and as you they, can. And they count your reps, yes. And and second of all, yes, the, the NFL teams do not do combines. They do, uh, there's one combine every year for the kids who are coming out of college for the first year, guys. And that's it. Now, the funny thing was, just to make sure that they were, uh, in fact, bullshitting me, I, I checked this up. There actually was a guy named Matt Morgan who played for the Rams. And he was, in fact, six foot six, But he's five years younger than this Matt Morgan. And perhaps a better wrestler. So you're calling shenanigans. I call bullshit. Raw huh. bullshit. You know there was a day when I could do reps with 225? You don't think you could now? Oh, god damn no. <laughs> no. It's ridiculous. I, my, my body would smash into shards. But I can still outwork Matt Morgan. Yes. Blinded. Yes. Borash interviewed Austin Aries. He had a bunch of cliches like the straw that stirs the drink and he likes to push buttons and shit. Austin and Aries... Or Austin and Aries. Austin, Aries, and Bully Ray had a fun match with a shitty finish. Bully Ray did a bunch of fun power spots like where he... He did a gut wrench suplex. Where, gut wrench suplex. I'm particularly mumbly this evening. He did a gut wrench suplex where he... Uh, Threw Austin through the air and didn't even leave his feet. He press landed with ease later. And after all these big man spots, Bully Ray, for what had to be the first time in his career, hit a top rope drop kick. Mm-hmm. And it looked fine. Came flying off, kicked Aries in the chest, landed on his back. Aries took a great bump for it, landed upside down on his head. Aries tried his tope through the ropes, and uh, Ray greeted him with a big boot. That was a great spot. So then Ray goes into the stairs. He comes up bloody. At the time, I thought quite a bit, although when I watched Sergeant Slaughter later, I realized I was wrong here. Aries is working over the cut. Brooke Hogan runs down, very concerned. She gets in his way. 
So Ares is pissed off. He drags her into the ring to yell at her for a while. Ray recovers, grabs Austin, throws him over the top rope. Hulk Hogan, I can only say that he shuffled down to ringside. He's at least 95 years old. He looked morose. Ray ordered him to get Brooke out of the ring, and Hulk did so. And right after that, Aries hit a nut shot and won. I was lame. And uh, in hindsight, Billy Ray got nothing out of that blade job. What a way to ruin a match. Yeah. Wacky interview with Tara and Jesse where they talked about Jesse's pecs and his abs and who was tweeting them. I never said anything about Brooke's appearance, by the way. As usual on the board. Neither did I. Well, Dave did. Mm. And uh, and uh, several people blamed us. They said, you guys. I never said anything about her appearance. Was Dave negative? Oh, yeah. I see. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, I was I her appearance meaning being there, but not like her physical appearance. Right. Her appearance at ringside did appall and and uh, horrify. But me. it's not because of how she was dressed. No. I see. Speaking of women wearing strange things, Tara versus Mickey James. Mickey was wearing what I believe was bedazzled farmer's daughter overalls. They had a match. They did the old Ric Flair stink spot where. Uh, you do the arm ringer and pull her down by the hair, or the baby face kips up, and you just repeat that over and over. Mickey made her come back, and Tara rolled out, of, rolled out of the ring, and Mickey did a Thez press off the top rope to the floor. That's a scary move. What was that? I dropped some. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it about the last four yes. shows in a row. It's not that scary. For some reason, I have a goddamn... I have a pair of, t- of nail clippers in here. And uh, well, I can think of why when people get uh, get talking for extended periods of time, such as uh, you right now or mm-hmm. Dave when he's doing a did you know fact, I start uh, dinking around with the nail clippers, and invariably I drop them right onto this uh, Hard thing service. that my roller chair is on. Got it. Okay. Literally the last three shows in a row I've done this. I'm waiting for someone to notice. Okay. Well, you're welcome. So uh, eventually, by the way, be very quiet. Can you hear this noise? I can't. I don't think it's over the headphones. That's my ankle. What? <laughs> yeah. It's very crunchy of late. <laughs> you want to witness this? Kind of. Hey, come here. This will be awesome for the listeners at home. Let's see if I can do it into the mic. Yeah, I was going to say. Oh, God. <laughs> That's disgusting, huh? Very. <laughs> it's like crunchy peanut butter. All right, first, you uh, kind of snapped it, and it was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I have a toe that does that. Both my knees do that sometimes. But then when you just started rolling it around, and it sounded like you had rocks in there, <laughs> that's bad. Yeah, good. I don't even know what's wrong with it. it feels fine. Yeah, who cares, then? Very crunchy. So, uh... Don't wrestle, everybody. Yeah. Jesse got on the apron, and, uh... Threatened Mickey, but she dropped him with a sidekick. But that distracted her, and so Tara could hit her with a uh, widow's peak for the win. Highlight of this was uh, when Jesse sold the sidekick from a woman, and he dropped to the floor of the arena, clutching his ribs and screaming, I was going to write like he was on fire. But Taz went with, like he'd been shot with a cannon. (laughs) I love Jesse. Jesse's great. He's awesome. Borash interviewed Rude, said he would win, and he's rich. Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe and Garrett Bischoff and Wes Briscoe versus Devon and Doc and two masked Aces and Eights guys. Presumably Mike Knox and somebody else. C.J. O'Toole, I believe was his name. Indie guy. That was my next guess. <laughs> so I'm not sure whose bright idea it was to uh, take Wes and Garrett and put them in the ring together for some double team spots, but uh, they were exposed. They were very green and it was clear. Got the heat on Joe. Hot tag Kurt. He got the ankle lock on one of the masked dudes. Doc was about to hit him with a hammer when Wes and Garrett made the save. And for just a brief second, and I mean not even a second, a half a second, there was a slight hint of a tease of a horseman beatdown, and then nothing happened, and Kurt pinned the masked dude with the ankle slam. Mm-hmm. Do the Aces and Eights ever win matches? I guess Devon won the TV title, but... That's about it, yeah. What a horrible invading group. 
Borash interviewed Styles, who rem- remembered his hair gel this week. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh, this is an improvement. <laughs> no, I wanted to continue to get worse. I see. It's part of the storyline. Well, see, he, did, he didn't cut it. It's still too long. So, uh, yeah, he said he'd, w- said he'd win. Chris Daniels versus AJ Styles. Yes. Just, you you did a you did a a a long prolonged build to what AJ was going to say. I did. And then you gave a hilarious payoff. Well, I'm sorry. I'm bad at radio. What do you want me to do? Daniels and Styles. Uh, they said this was their 115th match, and honestly, that seems low. That's only 12 matches a year in this company. I mean, when you count house shows and everything, that seems very low. Well, I haven't been in this company for 15 years. I guess not. Um, so, anyway, out of 115 matches, probably 100 of them were better than this. It was good, but they've done much, 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 much better. They did a bunch of stupid bumps into the apron. AJ got a cut over his eye. He hit the Styles Clash... But Daniels kicked out, so he went for a Styles Clash off the middle rope, but Daniels turned that into a Hurricane Rana, and then he had a Styles Clash of his own for the pin, and the best part was his action, his reaction to this. He was surprised and elated that he had beaten his rival with his rival's own move. So he won. I enjoyed it. It was good. It Crowd was good. heard it. Kinda. I went on a Long tirade. Much much longer than the Matt Morgan one about this TNA booking. It started off with a comment on the crowd, and then it is just how horrible, and I mean horrible, when you back over it, the, the booking for TNA has been. Bobby Roode wrestled Jeff Hardy. It was fine. No one cared. And why should they? Because what you got here is the guy who uh, was beaten for the title clean, then lost several rematches, to Austin Aries. Then he lost the Blood Feud match to James Storm. Then he lost the three-way for the title shot of the last pay-per-view. He got a win over Rude that I actually don't even remember how he won. James Storm, he threw him into a buckle. There you go. So, uh, yeah, that's completely irrelevant. And that's uh, the challenger. The champion is the guy who barely made it for the playoffs in the Bound for Glory Series tournament. Had to win, like, his last match to get in. And everyone, no one expected him to win, and then he did. So no one cared when he won. And then uh, he had a feud with Aries, but it was a bunch of good matches, but it was not the top part of the program. And since then, we have been told the most important things in the world are the motorcycle gang that runs in whenever they want to, and the daughter of the general manager and who she may or may not be having sex with. A distant third in the things to care about list is the world heavyweight champion and his challenger. Yeah. So, when you put the World Heavyweight Champion and his challenger in the main event of a pay-per-view, nobody cares. I don't know why they would. I don't know why I want to buy the show. This felt like the least important main event. Like, you could not try to book a main event and have it be less relevant. Don't challenge them. I'm... <laughs> yeah. They'll find a way. <laughs> so, they had a match. Rude was going for wins, and it occurred to me, Bob Rude was champion for like nine months, whatever it was, but all his wins were always fluky and weird. I'm not even sure what his finisher is. Fisherman Suplex? I believe it is the Fisherman Suplex. He, he didn't try that here. He tried a spear, tried a spine buster. I think he's used a cross face before. But whatever he tried didn't work. So the Aces and Nates appear, because they were the real main event star. And Rude signals for them... Come help me. And they didn't move anywhere. And so he was angry with them. I'm not sure what he wanted them to do. Run in and attack Jeff for the DQ? (laughs) Yeah. That was his plan. So they refused to enter the ring. And Hardy hit the twist of fate in one. So fluke win for the champion. Aces and Nates hit the ring. They beat up Jeff. Then Rude was mad at them. They beat him up. And the final shot of this pay-per-view was the Aces and Nates standing over Rude's prone body with the World Heavyweight Champion and his World Heavyweight Championship belt nowhere to be seen. Yes. They are irrelevant. <laughs> Correct. I uh, looked for a word. I went to the, 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 the I went to the thesaurus to try and find a word to uh, describe my feelings <laughs> for the show. 
I started with the depressing, but frankly, that was too uh, severe because that implied I went into it with positive feelings and and had those positive feelings dashed. And most of the f- words I looked for were, were too harsh, like horrible, horrifying, wretched, vile, this kind of thing. How about just irrelevant? Irrelevant actually may be the best word of all. I went with discouraging. <laughs> the show was discouraging. <laughs> I, I like irrelevant better because discouraging suggests that you were encouraged going in. Hmm. I started off on a scale of 1 to 10, and I went in a 5, completely neutral, and I left about a 3.5. So uh, you were, in fact, discouraged. I was discouraged. Hmm. About that. Regardless, thumbs down, everyone. Don't, Don't buy, buy this show. show. Don't buy this show. We watched Impact. And we did. The show kind of, kind of made me feel stupid, because nothing made sense to me in this one. And uh, I know we say that a lot about this show and a lot about wrestling in general, but nothing made sense in this to the degree to the degree that I started to think there was something wrong with me. Very possible. Let's get through this, perhaps. I will say that uh, I know everyone listening to this is expecting me to say that the segment with Joe Park was the best thing on the show, but in fact, you're wrong. There was something even better than Joe Park and his wrestling training at Ohio Valley Wrestling. So if you don't know what it is yet, if you haven't been on my Twitter, hang out for a while and try and figure it out for yourself. Here we go. So Bobby Roode comes out. He's pissed off, of course. Said he had made a business investment to guarantee he would be champion. It didn't happen. He demanded answers. The Aces and Nates came out, and Devon explained they had gotten a better deal. Rude demanded to know who would outbid him. They refused to answer. And they moved in to finish him off. So Jeff Hardy and James Storm came out to save Robert Rude. Rude disappeared. The Aces and Nates ran away. Right? That's about what happened. Why did James Storm save Robert Rude? I don't know what's going on. Jeff Hardy too, but mostly James Storm. Velvet Sky... Talked about coming back to win the knockout's title. She started talking about pigeons. She began to writhe around. This is a woman who was, like, trying to be sexy, but to not have the confidence to pull it off, which is amazing. This was, like, the picture-perfect... I hate the phrase, if you look up phony in the dictionary. But if you look up phony in the dictionary, it was Velvet Sky's promo here. When she started, it started out all right. She's talking about coming back and being motivated and this and that. And everything was, was, was believable. And then she started talking about her ass and pigeons that were getting ready to be loosened. I swear to God. And it all of a sudden became a promo that no living being in the history of the earth would have ever said ever for any reason. This failed. Yeah. Um... Mickey lost at the pay-per-view. She's very sad about this. These pigeons have been all cooped up, I believe she said. I don't know. With <laughs> a straight face. Yeah. I haven't exposed my ass in too long, is what she was saying. Do I live in a bubble, or do I just not get this pigeons reference? Is it just a, a, a tazism? Something or is there, is there something more to it that I've, over, I've missed on the if, Sopranos or something? If so, it's over my head, too. But, uh, well, let's find out. She's yeah, pigeons please. in her ass? Let the pigeons. Someone explain to me pigeons. what is going on here. I spelled pigeons wrong. Loose. That was more difficult than You I don't know been. how to use Google, Vinny. You gotta Google, like, pigeons ass. Ah, oh, look at that on YouTube. How to kick a pigeon's ass. <laughs> what? That's what it says. Followed by another video. Dumb ass pigeon. Hmm. Pigeons suck ass. There's a reference to Happy Days. Wow. With Let the Pigeons Loose? That, exactly that line. That actually sounds like uh, uh, Taz's, uh, uh, what he would be watching when he was growing up. That's true. Explain. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. Michael Pataki was an actor. He also played Governor Karnas on the Star Trek Next Generation. Michael Pataki played a guest spot on Happy Days Season 4 as Count Malachi, one half of the Malachi brothers. He was made famous on Happy Days for his line, Let the Pigeons Loose. 
and That's all any context, any explanation? No. no. All right, who cares? Although he also has been on... What's his name again? Count what? Count Malachi. This is a character who said this. He was also in Remo Williams. And something else that I saw, now I can't find. Got Dracula's Dog, which I believe I once saw on TBS. A hysterical movie. He once voiced a character for the Goddamn George Liquor Program. Really? Yep. That's what's called the Goddamn George... Uh, apparently that's a program that was within Ren and Stimpy. Wow. All right, go on. All right. So, Velvet Sky and Russell Madison Rain. Investigate. They had a uh, bad match, although I was disappointed. There was nothing laugh out loud horrible about it. It was just two wrestlers who were not very good having a match, and Velvet won with her pedigree. Kurt Angle, in a public service announcement, let the world know that Garrett Bischoff and Wes Briscoe will be having a tag match later. Just let us all know we could safely turn the channels. Then he gave them five-hour energy in blatant product placement. Wow. In blatant uh, trying to turn them on to some gizmos. It's a gateway drug, this five-hour energy. Right? Something like that, yeah. Daniels and Kazarian denied that they were the ones who had paid off the Aces and Eights. They said it was probably AJ Styles. We had Wes Briscoe and Garrett Bischoff versus Robbie E and Robbie T. And I know why I just took a shot at Wes and Garrett. And I thought when they got in the... When they got in the ring alone with Rob Terry, I thought, like, uh, I don't know what I thought. But it was okay. Ohio Valley works, everyone. They teach you how to wrestle. So eventually, Wes pinned Terry with a body press. He threw a fantastic celebration afterwards. His win caught himself totally off guard. And he and Garrett were celebrating in the ring, and Kurt was celebrating on the floor. And when Garrett and Wes turned their backs to him to celebrate to the other side of the ring... A masked Aces and Eights guy ran out and whacked Kurt in the knee. And they said that uh, Devon, or that Kurt will be challenging Devon for the title next week. So this explains why they would want, they would want to take him out now. All right. Um, I'm on uh, bodybuilding.com. There's apparently a uh, wrestling forum there. This guy spelled pigeons hideously wrong, much like you did, I'm sure. He says, I've never given this much thought before, but I'm rewatching Impact tonight. I have no idea why, he adds. And it suddenly struck me, what the fuck is Taz talking about? I know that he only ever says it when Velvet Sky is shaking her ass when entering the ring. But what's the connection here? And uh, this fella here says, it's basically the opposite of a motorboat. A chick puts a boob on each side of your head and squeezes. It comes from an episode of Happy Days. What? <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> okay. Hang on. It's on the internet. It must be true. I have not seen... Well, I've not seen many episodes of Happy Days, but I've seen enough to know that's out of character for the show. I'll say. Huh. Huh. All right. Let's move on. Are you satisfied with this explanation? I I'm satisfied for the moment. I'm sure someone will post something on the board and smarten me up. We had, as I punched everything... Footage of Joe Park in Ohio Valley Wrestling. He drove up to the building in a Volkswagen Beetle and his suit. He met with Danny Davis, who said this is the best place in the world to learn. They had trained more stars than anyone else. And he put Joe in his suit through a series of conditioning drills until Joe threw up in a garbage can. If that, that's exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> and if that doesn't sound appealing to you, I don't know what to tell you. The only thing I was disappointed with was the brevity of this segment. This could have gone longer. This There'll be more. Could have gone longer. There'll be more to come. It would have been great to have uh, Rip Rogers uh, shouting down Joe Park. But uh, hopefully they, they try to fix his rope running. I know everyone's mentioned that. I would uh, I would like to see that. That actually would be awesome if they, as they break it down. Exactly. And then demonstrate, you know, some people you will see do it wrong, like this. Mm -hmm. And then we'll all point and we'll say, yes, yeah, so I know who's talking about there. Tara met with Brooke Hogan. Said their boyfriends were wrestling tonight. She didn't want any hard feelings after her boyfriend kicked Brooke's boyfriend's ass. She wanted to know who she would be wrestling next week, and Brooke refused to tell her. Kenny King did a backstage promo, said he learned something from every loss, and he vowed to kick RVD's ass. 
It's a fine promo. That's fine. Jeff Hardy and James Storm versus Doc and a masked dude, probably Mike Knox. You'd have to be a shitty, shitty, shitty heel tag team to have a bad tag match with Jeff Hardy and James Storm. Yeah. And these guys were not nearly that shitty. It was a good match. It was really good. And uh, it's a very good match with a completely baffling finish. Yes. The baby faces. Oh, God, I forgot about this. All right. Yeah. The heels Here. beat on Jeff Hardy for about six straight hours. Yeah. Which is fine, by the way. Joe Park went from uh, from Orlando to Louisville and back while this match was taking place. Jeff finally tags uh, the hot hand, as Danny Davis will probably explain to Joe Park. He gave it to uh, James Storm. Storm runs wild. And uh, then the baby faces hit their finishers on both heels and pin them. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you mention the run-ins? All of the guys that ran in and were thwarted. Yeah. And, yeah. And they had a baseball bat. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff Hardy and James Storm beat up five men who had a bat. This is the worst. I mean, that's great and all if it's like a feud blow-off. Sure. But this match happened on impact for free in the middle of the... It was even the main event. Yeah. It was in the middle of the show. They like... This is like the death of Aces and Eights right here. Well, they've been dead for a while. They've been dead for months. Locked the coffin here in this match. This is the, the dismemberment of Aces and Eights. So yeah, five dudes in a baseball bat cannot beat Jeff Hardy and James Storm. So they were so angry at Jeff Hardy and James Storm for out-wrestling them that in a fit of rage, Devon chose to reveal the Austin Aries and paid them off. What? I, what? I was a little befuddled. What does one have to do with the other? I'll show you, Jeff Hardy. I'll tell you who gave me money earlier. It was Aries. What do you think about that, fucker? And Jeff looked around like, what the fuck do I care? I won on Sunday. <laughs> I won, I I don't won give anyway. give a shit who you paid off. You can always attack my opponent and I keep winning. That's great. Yeah, I, I didn't... Uh, I, missed... I didn't get why anyone would care. That's a problem. Yeah. There's more to come. So, upon hearing that Austin Aries had paid off the Aces and Eights, Hulk Hogan and Robert Roode were both freaking out backstage. He got them on the phone. They demanded an explanation by the end of the night. I'm not sure what explanation they needed. I, I wanted Robert to beat up. I hired these men to do it. Okay. <laughs> I belched right in the microphone. AJ Styles came out for a promo. He said that he had been doing the... Uh, basically, he was tired of looking out for everyone else. He said this is not about the fans. It's not about Dixie. It's not about me. It's not about uh, 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 Impact Wrestling. And finally, he said, I'm tired of doing the corporate thing and doing the right thing and looking out for everyone else. So I'm going to do my own thing. And presumably this meant a heel turn. And a haircut. And a body shave. So, fine. Okay. He's doing his own thing. Cool. He goes backstage and who is waiting for him but Dixie Carter. Yeah. Who greets him with the following sentence, which I am not making up. <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. This sucks. This is shit, everyone. This is bullshit here, alive on, not live, but on, this is recorded bullshit on television. AJ tried so hard, and he cut a pretty good promo, but man, God, Dixie just killed this. Absolutely dead as a door now. Who are you? Who are you? With her, with her her same look. And then they cut to Daniels and Kazarian. And Daniels is excited because AJ is not just leaving the building, he said, but he's he's leaving Impact. He's leaving TNA. And I was baffled because AJ, in the promo, specifically said, no, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I think he was, I think he was happy that AJ was leaving the building. I think this was... I don't know. I haven't talked to anybody about this, but... They taped three shows in two days. Yeah. And I just think everything just got. Well, in a when your storylines are too complicated and convoluted, shit like this happens. Do simple shit. Getting angry. Also, we were told that Kaz had a Christmas present for Daniels. We never saw what it was. Brian, have you ever asked anyone when, they, when you're disappointed with their actions, who are you? <laughs> no. Neither have I. 
It's never crossed my mind to ask this question. You've never asked me that? No. I've never asked you that. No. I'm confused and, and, by your actions regularly. And we have disappointed each other all the time. And we are combined 70-some years old. We've never used that sentence. Never. And I, I don't never plan, plan to. Yes. I don't know who you are anymore, Vinny. <laughs> You're not eating as much? <laughs> Well, I didn't ever say that. You started exercising? <laughs> yeah. You're in the gym, Vinny. You've lost weight. I don't know who you are anymore. Oh, God. You're coherent on actually, the show. Actually, you could say that. That I can see this now. It's all it's all, it's all, all coming together. <laughs> Kenny King wrestled Rob Van Dam. He took like 80% of the match. And uh, Rob made a comeback, and he went up top. He tried a crossbody. But King rolled through it and got a foot, got his foot on the ropes for the win. Mm-hmm. It's better than the pay per view match. Much better. And then he did a happy dance. Yes. Good. It's a little weird how you get a title shot and lose, and so you get a non title match after that. Yeah. And then win that. Now you get another title match. I don't understand That's this. That's wrestling in uh, this, 2012. Uh, this list of things I do not understand about this show. But yeah, it's not the first time this has happened. At least he gets a rematch after beating him in a non title rematch. I like Truth. Who lost clean to Antonio, and so he just gets another title match. Yeah. It's killing the integrity of this fake sport. It is. Everybody it, getting these championship matches coming off losses. All right, so Bully Ray met with Hulk Hogan. They still are pissed at each other. Okay, I got to say something about this. You can explain it here in a minute, but I got to say, I thought that this segment was pretty awesome. I thought that, that Bully Ray was awesome. I thought that that Hogan was was very good. I thought that they had a lot of passion. There was there was uh, there was more perceived reality in here than in ninety percent of the stuff you see in wrestling. Although, whenever someone in wrestling throws out someone's shoot name, kills it dead for me. That's my first complaint. Everything was going along great, and then I had to hear Terry and uh, and and uh, what's Bully's name? I forget already. Mark. Mark LaMonica. Mark! Terry! That killed it for me. And the fact that I have absolutely no goddamn idea what Hulk Hogan is talking about, like, ever. Right. I don't know, like, I think I think it's like with, um... I was gonna say Roddy Piper, but that's something completely different. Roddy Piper's actually better with the bullet points. I think Hogan just, like, all his life he just had to go out and do a Hulk Hogan promo and, and bury some heel. And not very complicated, you know? Hulk, uh, earthquake, uh, I'm really mad at you squishing me, brother. And uh, come to the Tacoma Dome and what you gonna do? It's very simple and formulaic. Now they give him like a big script. And this guy can't remember all that. Yeah. And he goes from here, he goes from there, he forgets this, he adds this. Yeah. He says this, which he shouldn't have said because it makes no sense. That's what this promo was. So in between not knowing what in the hell Hogan was talking about, I thought it was very good. I agree that uh, especially Billy Ray's performance was awesome. But yes, okay, I, I Hogan often made no sense. There's good reasons why Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan would make no sense. But Billy Ray, I'm trying to make sense of the story. The story is now that Bully and Brooke may actually not be a couple at all. Yeah, Ray is denying their relationship that, is, that it exists, but actually he said Brooke may have a crush on him. So now he's throwing the woman under the bus in an attempt to appease her father. Right? Something like that. They've never shown any affection towards each other. It was the one time they got caught on the couch. Yeah. She was apologizing to him, Yeah, he said, for her father. While adjusting her boobies. boobies. Yeah. So apparently this was a hell of an apology. <laughs> so, Bully should be thanking Hulk and hoping he gets upset at him more frequently. So Bully, yeah, he says they're not a couple, and Hogan immediately said, well, then I don't need to see you around her anymore. And I thought, that's right. I have no idea what is happening here. This was one of the segments that made me feel stupid. The best part was it wasn't even live. It was like heavily edited into this hodgepodge of confusion. So I can only imagine what the uh, the uh, uncut version of this would have looked like. There is good news. It led to a match. 
This, everybody, was the best thing on the show. This was the most fun I've had watching wrestling in a long time. Bully Ray versus Jesse. God damn, this match was great. And there was nothing to it. No. Bully Ray just uh, just beat the hell out of this guy. I can't remember if it's uh, Jesse or somebody else who had the, the reputation in, in uh, Ohio Valley for not liking to get chopped. <laughs> uh... If it was Jesse, it was not Jesse, word spreads because he got the bejesus chopped out of him in this match, and uh, and uh, I remember there was a time in my career where I threw a lot of really hard chops, and it got to the point where sometimes I'd do a match, and virtually my entire offense would just be really loud chops, and uh, hey works <laughs> yes. it really works when you hit a guy really hard with yeah. a chop fans will react to actual violence yeah yeah so he chopped it is all bully did for the first 10 minutes it seemed 10 grand minutes beat the fuck out of him he just chopped the holy hell out of this guy and then uh and then jesse cut him off and every now and then bully would fight back with yes a really loud chop and uh and the story of the match was bully beat him up for a long time Jesse hit him with about 60 drop kicks. Bully bumped all over the place. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Bully hit him with a one-man 3D, a 1D, and pinned him. Yeah. God, this was awesome. Bully Ray is so great. And Jesse, Jesse is Jesse's the man. really good. Yes. Now, granted, he was being carried by Bully Ray and that sort of thing. But yeah, but he's good. I mean, this is his best match. He held up his match. end of the bargain. This, is, this was his best match, but he's good every week. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, his, uh, he's green. But he's got everything. He's better than Wes and Garrett. He's got he's a good personality. Yeah. He's he's got great facial expressions. Yeah. He's uh, he can work all right. He can be carried. I'm a big fan of Jesse, and I'm a much bigger fan of of Bully Ray. Yeah. And the two of these guys together, I was in love with this match. This was awesome. Yeah. So thumbs up there. Two thumbs up. Yeah. So main event angle. Aries came out. He admitted he had paid off the gang. I'm glad to hear that Bully and and uh, Jesse Goddard's main event at Impact. They did, actually. Yeah, this was a deserving main event. This was a main event I'd have paid for. Yes. I just want to be entertained. That that match really entertained me. I had a lot of fun. I was, a, I was like a little kid wrestling fan again watching that match. That's the wrestling I love. That was great pro wrestling right there. It really was. They got a lot out of nothing. <laughs> That's what that story was. It wasn't like they didn't do anything, but they they picked their spots. They they uh, you know he didn't just chop him willy nilly. Every chop was at the perfect time, and the place just went nuts for that match. Bully Ray is stupendous. He's God. fantastic. This was great. Can he win Most Improved in his twentieth year or whatever it is? I sure hope so. Yeah. I know the TNA title doesn't really mean jack shit, but if he doesn't win the TNA title at some point, I'll be really disappointed. That guy has earned that title. It's not even... For whatever it's worth. It's not even the title itself. He needs to be in a main event. A singles main event match. Bully Ray challenging for the title. Mm-hmm. That would be a, that, that would be more of an accomplishment than just winning it. Well, I mean, he has as a heel. Has he? I think he had a, he had a world title match as a heel, I think. In recently. A, in a pay-per-view? I don't think it was a pay-per-view main event. He may have been like a six-man or something. But but yes, he he needs to be in the top program. At, at least once. All right. So Austin Aries came out. He admitted he had paid off the Aces and Eights. He explained that at one time he had been fighting against the gang on behalf of Hogan. And once he was done, Hogan had pushed him aside to jump on the Jeff Hardy bandwagon. This brought Hardy out. He said next week was Championship Thursday. He dared Aries to call him out. Aries refused to give the fans what they wanted. This was just preposterous. They had a brawl. Speaking of things not making sense. Yeah. So Jeff Hardy off... So Austin Aries wants a championship match. Yeah. And Jeff Hardy comes out and he says, all you have to do is ask. And so then Austin Aries is like, well... So all I have to do is ask? Well, it's not that easy around here. Meanwhile, the champion is saying, all you have to do is ask. And then Austin Aries is like, so you're offering me a title shot in front of your fans here? 
And I'm like, you're in the impact zone every week and for pay-per-views. Yeah. So where are your fans, Austin Aries, that were supposed to be, you know what I mean? Like, are you are you good? Are you asking for this match in Ring of Honor? Are you asking for this match? Where are you asking for this match at? Because you all wrestle in the same place every week. I was baffled. Where would he go to not be in front of Jeff Hardy's fans? I don't know. The dungeon. It's too hard, house. Befuddling. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought this show made no sense. There's a lot of that on this show. I feel it was. That's my point. And I thought it was me, but no, it was the show. So I, I feel better. So yeah, they had a brawl. Jeff had the twist of fate went for a senton. Aries ran away, and it ended. And it ended, ended. So go out of your way to see the Bully Ray match. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then while you're there, you may as well check out the tag match. That was also quite good. Don't watch anything else. <laughs> Yeah, I can't win them all. Let's play one last song here. To, no, they uh, can't. <laughs> to wrap it up. All right, let's get Impact done with. It was a good show. It was a good show. It was, it was not a newsworthy show. It, just, it felt like a show like a... Uh, like this felt like the, like a Thanksgiving show that they knew no one, no one would watch. So they had almost nothing happen on it. They had a graphic recognizing the victims of the Sandy Hook Massacre. It was very nice of them. We had Kurt Angle versus Devon for the TNA television title. Kurt's right thigh and left knee were heavily taped. Sucks to be him. So they had a match. It was very average. It is better than the last time they wrestled. Uh, as you noted, Devon is the one man who cannot have a good match with Kurt Angle. So they had the aces and eights out there. And I Kurt, think you're downplaying the uh, the uh, that fact. Devon is the one man ever. Yeah. Think about that. <laughs> think about who and how you must perform to not be able to have a great match with Kurt Angle. He's had two tries. It was better this time. Mm-hmm. But when you can't have a match with Kurt Angle, I don't know what to tell you, dude. I just don't know what to tell you. And I'm a fan of Devon, but I don't know. They just have bad chemistry. It's an amazing stat. Yeah. So the Aces and Nates were out there, and Kurt's crew of Garrett and Samoa Joe and Wes Briscoe, and they were all brawling. They got ejected. They all came back. And uh, somewhere in this melee, uh, one of them, uh, Kurt had the ankle lock on, and Devon tapped out, but no ref. And then a masked man hit Kurt in the back of the head, and Devon got the win. They had the uh, gimmick where everyone argues about who should get a title shot. It was the women's turn this month, or this, yeah, this month. So it was Brooke Hogan, and she had uh, the other Brooke, and ODB, and Mickey James, and Velvet in there. And she determined that ODB should not get the title shot. Her reasoning was because ODB's husband has a bad foot. ODB's husband is hurt, you see, and laid up, so she should be home taking care of him. Because she's a woman? That's what Brooke said, to which oh. ODB replied, kiss my ass. <laughs> which is the first time I've ever agreed with ODB. I will say these segments were significantly less infuriating than usual. They were fine. Although, at the very end, to cut to the chase, when it came down to uh, Mickey James and Velvet Sky, when Mickey James was chosen over Velvet, who is in fact a babyface, Velvet could not possibly have come off more bitchy. I am assuming she's turning heel. Literally impossible. Because like, this was Miz level babyface failure here. Yeah, but, well, the, 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 it's going to be. I mean, it has to be a heel turn because they emphasized when when Brooke was eliminated early in the show, she took a. She was very. Uh, uh, she showed good sportsmanship. She thanked uh, the other Brooke for considering her, and she wished the other women luck, and she walked away. So. That, in contrast with Velvet's performance at the end, indicates to me that she's turning heel. The other option is it's TNA and they have no idea what they're doing. I liked uh, I liked how uh, the other Brooke, her argument was something effective. I've been I'm I'm always around. I've been around. I want another shot without interference. And Brooke was like, "You okay? You've been around and you are around. You'll get another shot at some point." That's why I, I, I found a slightly more positive interpretation. You're not wrong. All right, tell me your interpretation. Well, it's simply that she had had other chances these other two had not had yet. Except those other two have had a million chances. Well, not in the recently. Uh, just, I see. Yeah. It's the best I could do. 
Kenny King got a promo bragging about his win over RVD last week. As he was bragging about this win, they showed him cheating to win. He got his feet in the ropes. He referred to themselves, he said they were tag teaming tonight, and he called them, quote, the two kickingest dudes in Impact Wrestling. Kickingest. It's Kenny King and RVD versus Matt Morgan and Joey Ryan. All I got to say about this, this finish was awesome. Broke down into a four-way, and Rob's down in one corner, and King is fighting Joey Ryan, and he lays out Joey Ryan easily. And then he turns, and he's eye-to-eye with big, scary Matt Morgan. And he looks at Morgan, and he looks behind him, and Rob is down in the corner. And he looks back at Morgan, and he flashes the peace sign, and he bails. Morgan kicks Rob in the face, and Joey Ryan pins him. Yes. I couldn't figure out why why Kenny King was suddenly a baby face, and this was answered. He was not. He's not. Yes. Yes. It was. Uh, yes. He, he's a, he was a baby face the entire match. They got along fine. He was cheerleading. But as soon as it came down to, uh, I can fight this giant or I can let Rob take the bullet, I'm out of here. A brilliant finish. Cass got a promo on AJ walking away backstage. He really didn't care about AJ. He wanted to talk about uh, the surprise he had for his fans. Boy, did he have a surprise for his fans. Took a phone call from Nick. They began to talk about Donner. Hulk Hogan came down to the ring. This took a long time. He moves very slowly these days. So the company had come a long way in 2012. Roster was stacked beyond belief. They're going to let the fans vote for Wrestler of the Year. The winner would be announced January 3rd, quote, on a very special episode of Impact. That's awesome. Aces and Nates interrupted. Devon said that 2012 was their year and Hulk, Hulk wouldn't be around for 2013. It will be a special Impact, by the way. It is the return of Stink. Who will be wrong? <laughs> Which they, by the way, they were wrong because they revealed it in the 1313 promo. Yeah. They even bother keeping it a secret anymore. No. That's who's coming back, everybody. So they were going to beat up Hulk, but Bully Ray ran down with a chain to make the save. Aces and Nates ran away, and Ray and Hulk had a stare down, and Hulk teased a handshake, but then he walked out without offering one, and this just pissed Bully Ray off even more. We have one of those segments where we could hear Jeff Hardy's thoughts, although this time we could hear his thoughts because he was speaking. That's a vast improvement. He said Aries will not win tonight. We had the uh, segment where Brooke Hogan cut Bruce Tessmacher. And Brooke took this news well. She wished her competitors luck. And she walked away just so they could get her ass on camera. I'm fine with that. Best part of the show. Oh, yeah. Best, uh, well, not quite Brooke's ass, so that was great, too. Frankie Gazarian came down to the ring. He had gifts under his arm. Waiting for him in the ring was a Christmas tree and what I described as a throne. It was a great big fancy chair. He noted that the most trees only had one star on top. This tree had two because I had pictures of himself and Chris Daniels on top of it. So he said that AJ Styles has lost his smiles. And he brought Daniels down to the ring. He called him a wonderful friend. And a saint of a man. And then he introduced Santa Claus. Yes. Chris Daniels was so ecstatic to see Sta- to see Santa, he nearly spilled his apple teeny. This is a man who does not hate Christmas, unlike no, myself. This man is full of cheer. He was blown away that as much as he uh, as, as great a friend as Kazarian is to him, he'd never he can't believe his friend pulled off a favor this huge. He got Santa Claus here in the impact zone. And Daniels was happy. Turned out they were so happy to see Santa that rather than accept gifts from him, they had a gift to give him Zubas. Zubas pants. Zubas pants. That made Santa happy. Daniel sat on Santa's knee. Kaz took a picture. He says, say Christmas. And they said Christmas. And they flashed a giant grin. And the whole impact zone clapped. They were very happy to see these men having fun. Santa asked Daniels if he had been a good boy this season. And they cut to the hard camera, which... From the angle they were at, was the first ring the back of Daniel's head. And uh, when Santa asked this question if he had been a good boy, he did this fantastic, slow burn, evil grin to the camera. It was so great. 
This is the best impact moment this of the year. This is so awesome. He said he, would, he had been so good, he got he rid the impact zone of AJ Styles. He wanted to use his Christmas gift for someone who needed it. AJ Styles' kids, because that loser wouldn't be able to get them anything. He was on fire here. At this point, James Storm interrupted. Never been so unhappy to see him. Segma was going great. Storm didn't care about AJ. Said he could... Uh, I don't know what he said. He said he was not there to defend AJ. He was there to defend Christmas. A lot of people worked hard to provide their children with a good Christmas, and here's these jackoffs making fun of it. So Daniels points out that Storm was selfish, selfish enough to pin AJ and remove him from title contention for a year, and thus Storm belonged on the naughty list. So Storm got in the ring. Kaz and Daniels hid behind the Christmas tree and threw ornaments at him. Storm said this is not the real Santa. He started quizzing Santa about the various gifts that he had brought him, or rather failed to bring him in the past, including a great big truck to go mudding. So finally, he said this is not Santa. He super kicked Santa. Actually, the best part was he said, uh, what did I ask for for Christmas last year? And Daniels and Kazarian came up with these, you know, Conway Twitty or whatever his name is, Conway Twitter. Uh, I forget and, which one they said. And, uh, Some country guy. The best part is... Travis Tritt. In the audience, I think it was both of them. In the audience, you hear just hear this this fan, several fans going, Beer! Yes. Beer! Of course, the answer was beer. And then uh, he super kicked Santa, and they had uh, Daniels and Kazarian standing. Santa was in the throne, and Daniels and Kazarian are on each side of the throne, and their hands are holding onto the throne, and their job was when Storm threw the super kick, they had to tip the chair over to help Santa take a bump. Yeah. This was so awesome. Yes. This segment was great. This was what pro wrestling is supposed to be. Any of you that think that I uh, find pro wrestling to be too dour, generally you're right. But this is an example of pro wrestling I love. This was great pro wrestling fun. Yes. That's what this was. These guys are awesome. Daniels and Kazarian are the best. And uh, obviously they're supposed to be heels. We're not supposed to like them. But uh, I don't give a shit. They're my favorite. I can't wait to see them on TV. That's right. I cannot wait to see them being bad guys and uh, and getting their comeuppance. Yes. Which will happen, of course. Of course. This was great. A literally perfect segment. Just fabulous. Oh, but the, the, the cap off to all this, by the way, Santa Claus got super kicked, and uh, Kazarian and Daniels, who at this point were only, uh, they only had a two-to-one advantage, they still ran away. Because they are heels. So awesome. Aries got a promo making fun of Jeff Hardy's mind-reading promos. Said he would win tonight. They did, in fact, drop a subtle clue that Sting would be coming back on one three thirteen. The subtle clue was Sting saying he, he would be back on one three thirteen. Immediately after this, they had an Aces and Eights meeting. They completely ignored what we had just seen. They, uh, they were pissed off. The president was pissed off. They hadn't taken out Hulk tonight. And then Devo wanted to have a meeting with somebody next week, and everyone voted yes. That was like, uh, did I get, did you get anything else out of this? No. Okay. We had Tar and Mickey James, as noted. Brooke Hogan picked Mickey James for the title match, and Velvet acted like a bitch. So they had a match, and uh, this week's Taryn Terrell moment, which is the biggest Taryn Terrell moment in a long time. Mickey does like a snap mirror, so Tara's sitting on the ground, and then Mickey goes to hit the ropes to come back and hit a drop kick. And when she hits the ropes. Taryn Terrell has basically gotten in her way. Because, you see, she had to give instructions to Tara. When a wrestler is sitting, you have to give them, I don't know, a sitting count? A five count to stand up? Sure. It was awesome. So they had their match. Uh, Mickey spiked Tara with a DDT. She made a cover, but Jesse yanked Tara to the floor. So, Not a DQ, by the way. No. Well, see, he yanked his he yanked his own woman out of the floor. He didn't touch the ref or the uh, competitor. 
It's silly. Oh, it's like, so it's so silly. if you were in UFC and and uh, Ryan, this is not UFC. Kane Velasquez punched you and I dragged you out of the octagon. Be all right. This is not UFC, Brian. Strange things happen in the sport. I'd like to make a football analogy, but I don't understand the game. There actually have been instances. Where if you were about to cross the uh, the finish line, what's that called? Touchdown. The goal line. The goal line, mm-hmm. and uh, and someone from the other team just tackled you from the sidelines. This actually happened. That's not allowed. No, it is in fact not That's allowed. It's against the rules. It happened. Uh, I forget the guy's name. It was a college football game in the like the fifties or sixties, and there's some guy running running down the sideline in the wide open. Or yeah, running down the sideline wide open. Nothing but green grass in front of him. And then from the sideline, one of his opponents comes over to tackle him and then attempted to go back on the sideline and hide. This tactic failed. And he tried. Although it did get him several talk show gigs. Oh, see. So it worked out for everyone. And, and, he, would, and he didn't kill the guy. That's the other important thing. When, with, this, with this illegal blindside hit, no one was hurt. So that's good. And they gave him a touchdown anyway, because obviously. So Tara won after all that bullshit. Uh, the second greatest part of the show, and would have been the best part, this actually was a good episode, now that I think about it. Second best thing in the show, and what would have been the best thing on many shows, Joe Park training in Ohio Valley. He was in there with Danny Davis and a bunch of trainees. So, gimmick here, that if you were paying attention, Joe was a shitty wrestler. So Danny was showing him how to do stuff, but not how to do, he was not showing him how to do stuff fake. Like, Joe would hit a shoulder tackle, and the guy wouldn't move. And then he'd scream at him, how much do you weigh? He'd say 350. He'd say, 350, you couldn't knock this guy down? And Danny hit the ropes and lay the fucker out. So Joe was trying to throw these forearms. He couldn't form the guy right. He tried to drop toe hold and couldn't get the guy down, and Danny Davis was screaming at him. And finally, they're doing these forearm spots, and Joe gets a little blood, and sees the blood in his hand, and he starts to freak out, and Danny calls him Josh. He says, my name is Joe, and he lays the guy out with a black hole slam, and he stands up and screams like abyss, and he he composes himself, and this was tremendous. And my wife stops what she's doing, watches the whole segment, and then concludes, this is the best gimmick ever! Yeah. Winner! Yeah, that's what she said. It was great. And he, he was being chastised about running the ropes, in fact. <laughs> a very Next week, it's got to be... His lockup sucks. <laughs> That's got to be next. Fix your goddamn lockup, Joe. That would be awesome. Uh, main event: Jeff Hardy versus Austin Aries. Had a very good TV match. Ref got bumped. Aries had a nut shot in the brainbuster, but no ref. Second ref finally ran down, but before he could count the pin, Robert Roode pulled him out of the ring. He jumped in the ring. He laid out areas with a spine buster. The crowd cheered for this. I don't think it was a face turn. I think he was just pissed off that Aries had paid the Aces and Ace to beat him up, and we still don't why, don't know why Aries paid the Aces and Ace to beat him up. But uh, ref recovered, and Hardy won with the twist of fate in the senton. So it was fun. And then the very last thing before they went off the air, they were trying to interview Hulk backstage. He really didn't want to talk about anything. And right before he got in his car, he looked across the parking lot, and there was Bully Ray and Brooke Hogan sucking face. Yeah. And the asshole interviewer tra- kept trying to ask questions, and Hulk just got in his car and drove away, brother. He just said, oh, shit, and sh- punched him. Last week, I'd just like to mention this. I like this impact. I liked it because there was some good wrestling, some good segments, some uh, some fun segments. And there was nothing that was really abominably stupid on it. Yeah. And uh, I know that, uh, obviously, we talked Tuesday about uh, people's belief that I I find this to perhaps be too dour, these programs. That was the exact word used, dour. And uh, and uh, I, have, I have come to an understanding with uh, Leonard F. Chikarison, by the way. I would like to publicly apologize for uh, calling him Leonard P. Chikarison uh, repeatedly. It just seemed like that should be his middle name. But it actually is F. And believe it or not, the F stands for fun. Leonard Fun Chikarison. Anyway, 
just wanted to mention that uh, one of the things that really bothers me about wrestling programming, one of the things that really gets my dander up is uh, when stuff doesn't make sense. And part of the problem with wrestling nowadays is, uh, as I noted Tuesday, there's 11 hours of WWE in four days. So a bunch of geeks sitting around a table had to write 11 hours of programming in four days. For four straight days. And if you watch, like, Tribute to the Troops, the Tribute to the Troops was shot out of order, so everything was all wacky. But anyway, point is, with all of this programming, logic, storylines, common sense falls through the cracks sometimes. And sometimes it falls through the cracks in a monumental fashion, and that makes me really angry. Anyway, the point of this is, Last week, my buddy Trino had a kung fu movie marathon at his house. Nice. Yeah. He said, everyone come over. We're going to watch some uh, kung fu movies, some bad 70s kung fu movies, and uh, we're going to have barbecue pork. So this is right up your alley, Vinny. I was going to say. You were busy getting married. That's... Or engaged. Engaged. But but you're... Yeah. Essentially the same. So anyway, we're we're there at the kung fu movie marathon, and... uh, you know, there's obviously Trino and, and a couple of people that are that are in the martial arts. Some of them do kung fu, some do jujitsu, and there are uh, several people there that uh, are just friends of Trino's. They don't do any martial arts whatsoever. They're just watching these movies, and uh, these normal people, these they were not. I guarantee you, not a single one of them was a wrestling fan. Watches any wrestling whatsoever. This has nothing to do with wrestling, but they're watching these movies and throughout the movie for two straight hours. Every three minutes, I would hear. So wait a second, didn't blah 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 blah? So I thought blah 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 blah. So it wasn't blah 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 blah. These people were dissecting these movies. These these movies were bad movies, you see. Right. And so when the people watched the movies, it was like, wait a second. In the previous scene, the guy did this, but now he did this. Or that guy's hair looked like this in the last scene, but now it looks like this. That doesn't make any sense. They watched the movie, and every time something didn't make sense, they made sure to point it out to the world. So, it's two hours of this. But I just sat there, and I just... The reason I bring this up is because a lot of times, people that write wrestling uh, assume that wrestling fans are really stupid. And so they think, oh, well, you know, it doesn't have to make sense. You know, these people are stupid, or these people don't care, or these people don't pay attention. And uh, all I want to say is this could not be further from the truth, especially when you are when the business is such that there are maybe more hardcore fans and casual fans in some ways, at least that are watching every single week. Those are the people that really are paying attention. Your casual fan is paying attention. Your hardcores are really paying attention. So try to write for your audience in such a way that they're not constantly noticing that shit doesn't make sense and that last week this guy was a good guy and now he's beating up Santa Claus or whatever the case might be. Try to make your shows make sense and maybe that will help people get into your programming and maybe more people will uh, will tolerate it on a weekly basis and perhaps become fans that want to watch every week. But anyway, this impact was good. Yeah. Thought I'd throw that out there. And Kung Fu movies are fun. <laughs> All right, let's uh, get into Impact. So you don't watch the show? No. It was apparently not live, so... No, it was taped. All right. Bully Ray came out for a promo. He wanted to know what he had done, what he needed to do to impress Hulk Hogan. It was open fight night, so he called Hulk out, but he just wanted to talk. They played Hulk's music, but Brooks came out instead, and they had a conversation that it sounded like it was picked up over the mic... Uh, over the TV mic, but it was not picked up over the house mic. So I don't know what the audience did watching this, like a minute or two play out. But Brooke came out, she told Ray that he knows, or for her exact words, Ray was playing dumb, saying there was nothing to know. Brooke said she didn't know how Hulk knew, but he knew. So they apparently, watch neither, goddamn show? neither of these people watches Impact either. Nor did anyone text Brooke, them and say, oh my god, you guys, it was on television. No. no, they have no friends. Wow. Or their friends don't watch it back either. Oh, that's believable. So Brooks suggested they go find Hulk, show him what kind of man Bully was, and 
at the end, at the very end, where he let his guard down and started to ask a question like, how could he know about us or something? But then he looked in the camera and he walked away. It was drama. So they were gone. Austin Aries came out. He called out Bobby Roode. So he was not mad because he had screwed Roode first and then Roode had screwed him back, so they were even now. He wanted to uh, go ahead by beating Roode in the match tonight. But he wasn't going to do it here. He was going to do it in the main event because, God damn it, he was a main eventer. Samoa Joe called out the masked dude with a hammer. It was uh, presumably Mike Knox. Joe wrestled tonight with a shirt on. Mm. Had a sh- had a uh, short match. It was fun. What kind of shirt? A t-shirt? An uh, Impact Wrestling t-shirt. It's mm. weird. Yeah. The, uh, the, the only thing wrong with this match, I've not been inside the Impact Zone, but I'm under the impression like all the fans are on one side and the camera's on the other side of the ring. Uh, yeah. it depends on the attendance, but, uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, there's a point here where the mass dude to put on a chin lock with his back directly facing the hard camera. Oops. And, uh, yeah. But other than that, it was totally fine. It was short. Joe choked him out, as he promised. And he went for the mask afterwards, but the other Anaces and Nates dudes hit the ring, and Joe bailed. And the announcers were sure to point out this is not cowardly, this was smart, because there were six guys in the ring. Robbie E. and uh, Hollywood Jesse had a confrontation backstage. Oh, God. They called, they called each other bro and dude repeatedly. And finally, Robbie E. challenged him to a bro-off in the ring. Yes. So we had Kenny King uh, said hi to Christian York backstage. Christian York was not impressed. We had Robbie E. versus Hollywood Jesse in the bro off. Jesse has his own music now. It's awesome. It's, uh, it's all synthesizers and drums, and it sounds like something a 1980s Japanese pro wrestler would have used. Ah. Or, or for that matter, a 2000 Japanese pro wrestler. But sure. It's awesome. Yeah. So, Robbie E. was doing wacky comedy. Like he said, there were three rules, and he only listed two of them. What were they? You can't get. The, the two rules he listed were. It's every bro for himself, and everything you do has to end in a bro. Huh. Yeah. So, so he, didn't, first, he didn't mention the third one, or you forgot the third one? No, he did not mention it. Hmm. Oops. I believe this is supposed to be comedy. I see. Because he's also doing things like rule A and rule 2. I yeah. see. Yeah. So, Robbie did a funny bad dancing. This is much funnier bad dancing than Vicky Guerrero's funny bad dancing. Then Jesse went and he had his new music and it was too slow to dance to, so he just did bodybuilding poses instead. He pressed Tar a few times. And then he got in Robbie's face and called him dude. And Robbie said that that had not been as bad as he was expecting. But uh, this is bros, not hoes. And also, Jesse was disqualified for calling Robbie a dude and not a bro. He was about to declare himself the winner when Rob Terry interrupted and said there was one more bro to go. So he started doing his own bodybuilding poses. He pressed Robbie E. over his head a few times. Robbie E. played it off like he was terrified and resisting. And the music changed. And I, I can't say that Rob Terry was dancing. But he pumped his fists. He did some really bad tumbling. He did some one arm push ups and he went, Yeah. He did some tumbling? He yes. Like a forward roll? A backward roll. Really? Yeah. He did like a leapfrog and touched his toes. <laughs> Rob Terry? Yeah. My God. <laughs> and then he just he grabs the microphone and he said, Bro. He drops the mic and walks out. And Jesse and Robbie E. will have to slack and draw it in speechless. My God, are they oh, Robbie E. and Jesse together now? I believe they are. Oh, my God. This is a great segment. This sounds like something I actually need to watch the entire show to see. Sure. Uh, Rob Van Dam is in the ring calling out somebody and he's talking about how young and impressive this guy was and Kenny King was backstage thinking it was going to be him. It turned out to be Christian York. And King was bummed. So, 
He wrestled. Uh, there was one point where he had a very terrible exchange of forearm strikes. Other than that, it was fine. And uh, Rob with the split leg moonsault and the rolling thunder and the frog splash, and he won. Christian York was signed. Apparently, just so he could do jobs every week. Sure. He was every week. He knew jobs whenever he appears. But uh, that was that. And King, Kenny King did not come out at the end. Steve Vaughn had a meeting with the Aces and Eights, saying he had a new prospect who was uh, hard to get along with and a little arrogant, but that's what they wanted. And Doc showed, showed up with some hotties and said everything was going to work out fine. We had more with Joe Park and OVW. Joe said that his family had a history of uh, athletic achievement, starting with his brother Chris, going all the way back to his grandfa- grandfather, Jebediah Park, who had once nearly beaten George Hackenswit in a bare knuckle fight. <laughs> really? Yes. They went from this to Danny Davis, saying that Joe was dumber than a box of rocks and, quote, didn't have anything. <laughs> that's that's Danny Davis. <laughs> They showed the incident where Joe bled and snapped and made a trainee out, and Danny said this is a good thing, and Joe needs to run with that, but he's not applying himself enough. Uh. Doesn't have anything. (laughs) Not even size. No. (laughs) The best act in wrestling was on TV. Actually, this is not, oh, they came out later, but they had a quick bit here. Uh, Kazarian was in the merchandise section making sure that their shirt was still not on sale, and in fact it was not. They said they had one more Christmas present for everyone, and then Kaz would be stacked of AJ-style t-shirts in the trash. Rude said he would beat Aries tonight, and he would beat Hardy for the title later. Sting got a promo. Apparently he's going to be back next Thursday, not even the pay-per-view. Yeah, January 3rd. We talked about that last week. Oh, is that next Thursday? Yes. Oh, there you go. Daniels came out. There's no one in wrestling who is having more fun right now than Christopher Daniels. That is for sure. Yeah. And the only guy who's close is Kazarian. So Daniels said it was over five night. He could call out anyone he wanted. And he wanted to, even though they had just had their last match, he wanted to, uh, what did he say? He called out AJ. He said, we were supposed to have our last match, but that was just our last match until our next match. He calls out AJ, and they play his music and pyro and an entrance video, and of course it's Kazarian and AJ's gear. He comes out, and he does a promo, and AJ's voice better than AJ ever did. They so can never beat Daniels. Daniels is better looking and smarter, and uh, it's hopeless, and he started talking about threatening to go find Claire Lynch, and Daniels grabbed the mic away and said, No! Nobody wants that! <laughs> So Chavo Hernandez interrupted, and this thing was so great until he came out. And then Chavo Guerrero threatened to said that he was going to end their year with a foot right up your rear. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He did. Come on, Vinny. I, I'm not making that up. I'm, not... <laughs> I'm going to end your year with a foot up your rear. Yeah. All right. So they had a match. And, and did he fine. end his year with a foot up the rear? No one's foot went up anyone's rear. Uh, Chavo and Hernandez both hit topes at the end, and uh, Kaz missed AJ's springboard forearm, and Chavo followed with a frog slash for the win. So the champs would be the challengers in a non-title match, and presumably this will lead to a title match. Don't ask me. I don't know what it's going to lead to. It's crazy. Hardy cut a promo, saying that uh, he was going to enjoy watching Rude and Aries beat each other up later, but revenge was on its way. And he sounded maybe 10% awake in this promo. The East and the Nates were trying to recruit a new member. It was Mr. Anderson. They wanted him on their team. He said he was not sure. God knows why. (laughs) He was not sure about this. They offered him women. He said he would consider their offer, and he wanted time to think about it, and he left with the chicks. 
Let's let's recruit a massive underachiever who hasn't even been on TV in seemingly months. Yeah. Small test, Brian. You have to start at the bottom, work your way up. I guess. Gail King called out Brooks Tessmacher. The uh, reason was that uh, Brooks had ended Gail's title run many months ago. And that is a pretty good match. Tessmacher at points in this match used both her ass and her vagina as weapons. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, finally, she missed the top rope elbow, and Gail followed with eight defeat for the win. I presume this would lead to a title match between Gail and Tara. I guess it doesn't matter. It's just an impact match. Then we had the main event, Bobby Roode and Austin Aries. This was awesome. Both guys are heels. Both guys were trying to cheat constantly. But because they were both heels, they both knew what the other one was up to, and none of it ever worked. <laughs> so, like, Aries faked a leg injury, and so Roode started kicking him in the bad leg. And then, of course, Aries dumped him outside and started jumping up and down to prove his leg was all right. And they were trying to pin each other for uh, like grabbing the ropes. They tried to use weapons, but they both got caught. They, they, were, they were both on each other the entire time. It was a really fun match because neither guy, they were both heels, clearly. It's not like one guy got the heat and there was a big comeback. They just went back and forth, busting their ass the entire way, and it was fun. And finally, Earl was fed up with their bullshit. He grabbed them both. He brought them in the middle of the ring. He scolded them violently. He... The, the, the tongue lasting of a lifetime. Finally, they could take no more. They kicked him in the gut and threw him out of the ring. They celebrated briefly. Then remember, they don't like each other, and the chair was in the ring. They both died to the chair. At this point, Hardy music played. They braced for him uh, to come out from the entrance ramp, but he came up behind them and laid them out, and uh, that was how the show ended. But, this uh, sounds like the best well, main event in weeks, at least since tremendous. the Raw it, main event. It did not have trying to decide if this is better. It's a different was, kind of awesome. Yeah, this is not this is not funnier, although it was funny. Uh but it was I don't know. <laughs> it was it was better in some ways. Um there was a point where they showed Jeff in the crowd and we could hear his thoughts again. Ah in the middle of a match? Yeah. <sighs> I, well at least it was right before they went to commercial. They threw it to commercial we heard I Jeff's thoughts and then we went to commercial. So it's not like so in the middle like of the was, match you saw Jeff there and then you heard his voice over commentary? Yeah, that, that would have sucked. That would have infuriated me. And it sucked anyway, but it, was, it sucked less the way they did it. I see. But, uh, especially because his thoughts were so goddamn uninteresting. Yeah. Yeah. He's got nothing better to think about than these uh, these boring thoughts. Yeah. So hmm. that was impact. It was a hell of a main event and a very fun show. And, uh, yeah, I'm happy. Well, as soon as I get home, I'll uh, check that one.